Joe, this is so great to have you here in the presence. Whenever you're in my presence, I am lifted, I am empowered, I'm a better person. Even if you don't even speak, if I'm just near you, I feel like I'm a better person. It's really amazing. <laughs> Those are kind words. But... Thank you, man. What you have done in your career and what you continue to do as, as a person is so amazing. The, the legacy that you have in music as a performer, as an artist, as just the, the sheer passion that you have showed with music. It's been an amazing journey. And as I just review some of the notes on you as far as what you have done, it's, it's, just, it's, it's been an incredible, an incredible journey that you have done in your life. This is powerful. Where did it begin for you as far as how, where did you learn music? Was music around the household when you were a child? Where did it all start? Well, you know, my father, you know, he was from Calabria in Italy. And he was a trumpet player. Hmm. You know, the family, they were uh, carpenters, you know, woodworking people. Yeah. But, you know, in Italy, in these little small villages, you know, everybody plays an instrument. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's known, yeah. you know. Yeah. So my father played trumpet. And uh, <clears throat> I'll tell you a quick story. <laughs> uh, my son, Mike, and uh, Toto, the, you know, they were in Italy. And uh, Mike, uh, the guys got invited for an interview, talk show. And nobody wanted to go. They would always send Mike. <laughs> you know, he was their ambassador, so yeah, to absolutely. speak. <laughs> so Mike, you know, this girl is doing this interview with Mike, and all of a sudden she gets a note, and it's uh, somebody emailed the show or called the show saying that he was, he thought he was a relative of Mike, the Beccaros, you yeah. know. And Mike says, yeah, we get this all the time. <laughs> but when the guy's name ended in an A, Beccara. Beccara, he knew that they were related because in the whole village up there, there's all these Beccaros, but there's a also a group of Prokaras, it ends with an A. And when my dad came to the States back then, they would change it sometimes. The gentleman they made they a, a mistake put an that signed him in yeah. and took his A for an O. <laughs> so my father didn't want to call any, cause any vibes, <laughs> so he left it alone. <laughs> so, anyways, so Mike says, Yeah, tell him we're related, you know. And the guy emails a picture of my father holding his trumpet when he was 18 years oh old. My gosh. And Mike saw that picture and said, that's my grandfather. That's the real thing. You know, he knew <laughs> right away. That's a wild story. Yeah, yeah, it really, really is. But anyway, so when my father, as uh, soon as he got here to the States, he got drafted. Hmm. And he ended up in the uh, engineers in St. Michel, France. Wow. He lost his teeth. He couldn't play trumpet anymore, hmm. could read music real good. Yeah. And he took up, and he was in, a, in New Britain, Connecticut. That's where they ended up. And that's where you know, I was born. He settled, yeah. He uh, was an Italian symphonic band. And they needed a snare drum player. So he just made it a point to pick up you know, the snare drum because he could read, you know, and, you know, he just had, maybe he played snare drum over in Italy as yeah. a side instrument. Yeah, you know? yeah. So anyways, <laughs> he belonged to this Italian symphonic band, and he also belonged to the Italian-American World War Veterans Drum and Bugle Corps. Interesting. <laughs> and he taught snare drum. <laughs> and he knew, I don't know how he learned it, but he knew all the rudiments seven stroke roll, five stroke rolls and all that. And the whole thing with them, right, drum and bugle corps, they either played two four cadences right or six eight. Absolutely. Those two beats. Absolutely. Well, I remember so clearly, he would take me to the drum corps rehearsals. I'd watch my father, you know, and I watched these young guys, you know. He was teaching them, like he would put a quarter on the table and this is what uh, two s sticks you know yeah, one s sticks, big, big sticks big yeah. beads you know and there he is teaching them and he says and 
the quarter wouldn't move, you know. He's, <laughs> he, That's a skill, yes. <laughs> yeah, gimmick like that. So anyways, you know, we, I came home and he had a beautiful Ludwig metal snare drum, mm. you know. So I would like take it out and, you know, be, I was an asthmatic pretty bad in those back oh. then. I was about five, six years old. Yeah. And I'd take it out, you know, tap away on it. And then he had a friend, Frank Skinner, hmm. and they used to, he used, this Frank Skinner used to play at a local bar, and my father used to hang with him. My father really liked to put it away, you know, <laughs> so to speak. And he, this gentleman left his drum set at our house, and all it was, you know, was a, you know, bass drum, yeah. no hi-hat. It had a pedal, and one day when I was sick home, I set it up. <laughs> I no, like I said, no high foot pedal. My father's snare drum and his bass drum. My father used to put it under the bed, and I took it out and set it up. <laughs> and I started playing two, you know, two four cadences. <laughs> I just remembered, and I just, you know, my father never, you know watching the kids, the guys at the drum corps. Yeah. I just, and I, you know, I'm left-handed. Yeah. But I, you know, set it, I put the sticks in my hand and I just went away and started playing these beats out of nowhere. <laughs> Two, four and six, eight cadences. Absolutely. And that's how it all, for me, started. You know, I fell in love, you know, all through, uh, I played, uh, I got to be about, seven or eight years old, and I joined. My father brought me to that drum corps. That's amazing. You know, and yeah. I started marching in the parade with them, Memorial <laughs> Day, playing the cadences, you know, two, four, with a field drum. <laughs> and I had my brother Dom and my brother Sam, so Dom played field drum with me, and my brother Sam was the bass drum player. That is incredible. One of the bass that drum players. That is incredible. And we, you know, through our, up until I was about 10. Yeah. We played in that drum corps. And then my father was in an Italian symphonic band, like I said. They used to play these beautiful Italian symphonic marches. You know, yeah. they're not 2 4 or 6 right, 8. Right, right. They're in 2 4 and 6 8, but they just. You know, the tie-in feast where they carry the saint. Absolutely, yeah, People yeah. pin money on yeah, the saint, yes, you know. Yes, yes. And they would play a march for them, a symphonic march. Yeah. But these were not real raucous two and four. They were just really relaxed, easy tempo marches. So I used to, from New Britain, my dad and I, not my brothers, just my dad and I, we would go to Hartford, Connecticut. And he was in a... Uh, the Stars of a Lady, it was called La Stella di Di Italia. <laughs> that means the Stars of Italy. Yeah. And it was a symphonic band that used to play for those feasts. And I would march with my father in that band, and he could, he had everything memorized, That's all amazing. those beautiful marches memorized. And I would play the cadence and do the roll off, and then when the art band came in, my father, I would drop out because I didn't know the parts. <laughs> and I couldn't read then. I was only like 10, you know, yeah. 11 years old. But anyways. But your ears were working at that time. Yeah. That's what started to happen. Yeah. And a clarinet player in that, you know, band started to, I used to ask some questions about reading. Yeah. You know, what, what, what is uh, the 2-4? Uh, at the beginning of the piece mean or or what does the six eight mean he says oh that's the time signature and he t explained to me what mm. a time signature was and before you know it it started I started to put it together mm. and then in Hartford there was the uh, state theater where they used to bring in all the big bands now I'm in junior high school at this time and after every Friday after school matinee, we would run down to the State Theater and all the big bands, you know, we'd hear Benny Goodman, Tommy so, Dorsey, Gene Krupa, oh you know, gosh, bands yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. And 
the the pit band. They had a pit band that would, you know, after the movie, the pit band would rise come up, up rise so, up, yeah, yeah. like the Paramount in yes, New York. Yes, they yes, yes. they play a you know an overture, <laughs> go back down. So <clears throat> I went by the stage door outside after when it was over, and I looked for that drummer in the pit band. And I says, hey, do you teach? <laughs> he says, yeah, I teach at C.J. Khan, you know. So I says, I'd like to take lessons, you know. So my father brought me there, and we set up lessons, you know. Yeah, and incredible. he never once said anything about a time signature. You know, he'd give me a, a reading lesson, and I'm, you know, just, he play it, you know, and I'm using my ears and yeah, playing. Yeah. He say, hey, you read pretty good. <laughs> and I'm, I'm playing what he's, you know, what he's playing. Well, your ears are developed to hear that. That's yeah. powerful. So anyways, yeah. that's, I went that way for a while. I didn't even know what I was doing, really. Because so I didn't know what the, really what the, you know, until that clarinet player taught me what, yeah. he taught me more about the time signatures and stuff like that than my private teacher did. Yeah. So wh when, did, wh when did your education start to get more formal? You know, who, who was, I never was, had formal. There was nobody in the, in no. the, in the Connecticut? No, really what happened, let, let me tell you what happened. Interesting. Amo Richards, famous yeah. Vi player. Yeah. He and I went to the same church. We sang in the choir together. <laughs> we went thing, to catechism together, wow. you know. And our church, we also had a drum corps. You know, and, and, I, and me and my brothers played in that drum corps. <laughs> so anyways, one day at catechism, Father said, uh, uh, he says, uh, Father Toscano, his name was, and he played piano. <laughs> and every Friday, we had CYO dances, and we used to dance to the Victrola, you know, yeah. play. You know. Those Christian youth orchestras. Yeah, those, those, CYO yeah, was yeah, called. Yeah, yeah. Q, uh, Catholic Youth Organization. Yeah, yeah. No orchestra. We yeah. just used to dance to records. Yeah. So one day he says, I want to start a band to play for dances on Friday. He says, you know, I'm, I'll play piano. He says, who plays an instrument? So me and Amo, we raise our hands, you know. And Amo says, Father, I play the xylophone. He says, great. He says, and what do you play? I said, I'm a drummer, but I don't own a drum set. <laughs> you know, I couldn't, we had nothing then. Yeah. So he says, well, let's, what can we do to get a drum set together? And I said, well, we could use some of the drums from the drum corps. We could use, a, they had a Scotch bass drum, yeah. you know, like 14 by 20, yeah. 22. <laughs> you know, I says, we have a field drum we could use for a tom-tom, and yeah. my father has a snare drum. We could use that for the snare drum. <laughs> and if for a cymbal, we have a cymbal, but we'd have to you know, buy a, a used cymbal stand. And we need spurs so the bass drum does it roll, roll, roll over. <laughs> I said, I have a snare drum and a, you know, so no hi-hat, nothing like that. So we went. We went and found one of those old, old Ludwig foot pedals oh with all the holes in them, oh you know, my gosh. We, with a cotton beater. <laughs> the big and, cotton felt yeah. beater, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, check this out, and then we, we got a pair of spares so the bass drum wouldn't roll over, and I got one of my father's, you know, my father was a carpenter, yeah. I got one of his long screwdrivers, <laughs> and we took a field drum, and we, we put it on the bass drum, the Scotch bass drum, and we put the screwdriver through the tom-tom rods oh and through God. the bass drum oh rod. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so it wouldn't roll over. So there was my drum set. Snare drum, bass drum. Check this That's out. That's resourceful. <laughs> and we, we used to play every Friday. And we play either waltzes and our polkas. That yeah. was our... our a repertoire, right? A repertoire. <laughs> so wait, th this is the cutest story of all. State Theater, now where we used to go and hang out. Right. Well, a little later on, we formed a band without Father Toscano. And w one of the you know guys that hung with us was a real good singer. So we formed a quartet. And we used to go to the State Theater. So this singer... Louis Belson was playing with Tommy Dorsey. And we went by the stage door and we waited for the band to come out. And when Louis came out, 
the singer said, hey, Louis. <laughs> he says, we have a little band at our church and we have our own rehearsal hall. And would you come? And, you know, we'd just like to show you what we got going. Oh, my gosh. And Louie and Charlie Schaefer's yeah, absolutely trumpet player. Yeah. Trumpet yeah, player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They both came with they us. They came? Oh, it was man. only about five minutes yeah. away, you know. <laughs> and Louie walks into that room, and he sees my drum set. <laughs> but this is the best of all of it, man. You know, no stool, just a chair. He sat down and played on that set. Oh my God. You would have freaked out, oh man. Oh my gosh. Would have freaked out. What a saint. It's, wasn't that, and you know, he was my hero yeah. from then on. Yeah, yeah. Then shoot, 40, uh, 30 years later, I moved to California and one of my first gigs at Dante's, this jazz club, yeah. I get called to play Vibes and Conga Drum for Louis Belson. Oh my and we're at Dante's and I meet him and I said, do you remember me? And I says, do you remember at the Casa Andre, that was the name the of the look. church, you know, yeah. the hall. I said, do you remember sitting down at my drum set? And he goes, oh my God, skinny. <laughs> that was my nickname. <laughs> okay, and there I am. And <clears throat> the next week, one of my first gigs moving to LA was to record on Louis, one of Louis' albums. Unbelievable. Percussion and vibes. Unbelievable. Un can, unbelievable. Can you imagine? That's un un One of my first gigs in L.A. That in itself is that is an a, incredible story? That, that's a movie more than a story. <laughs> that's a movie. It really, really is. But your perseverance, your, your, your desire, your calling for music, that's what, that seems to be what drove you to get the drums and play the music and stand by the stage and talk to these guys and invite them. That's an incredible, you know, you know just feeling that you must have had. So when I was studying with that teacher, his name was Bob Schultz, you know, from the theater. Yeah. One day I was, you know, all alone and I, we had this park, Colts Park, and they had a band shell. Mm. And they used to, every Friday, they would have a band come in and play. Different kinds of bands, you know, marching bands, you know, concert bands, yeah, I mean, yeah, you know. Yeah. But one day, so I'm all alone and I take a walk. I'm going to go to Colts Park, see what's happening, just to hang, you know. And it's only about a mile away, you know, no, you know, I couldn't, I wasn't driving the car then. I think I was about 15. Huh. And I, you had to kind of go down this hill, but as you're going down there, you could hear the band, you know, playing. Yeah. And I get goose pimples. Wow. I hear this incredible big band and the drummer is smashing away, you know. And I get closer and closer, and now I'm really freaking out. <laughs> and I'm just standing there looking up at, you know, the drummer. And then I decide to go around to the stage door and wait for them to come out. And, and the, meanwhile, the door was open. <laughs> you know, it was a hot night, you yeah. know. And the stage, uh, the, yeah, the door was open. And I'm watching him, he's grooving away. And when it's over, they started, the, you know, intermission. I says, hey, to the drummer, I says, do you teach? <laughs> he says, yeah, I teach at St. Minix. You Why, are you a drummer? I says, yeah, I play the drums. I said, what's your name? He says, Al Lepak. <laughs> Al the legend, yeah, okay. absolutely, yeah. I yeah. used to shine shoes to earn money back then, you know. Earn, you know, what do you, how much you charge? You know, 250 a lesson. Hmm. So I went and took a lesson. And we befriended each other, yeah. you know. He says, well, I got, you know, this gig. Oh, can I come and help you, wow. you know, bring your drums? Yeah, yeah. And he was playing at a, at a hotel, Bond Hotel. I helped him set up his drums, you know. And I used to practice my butt off for him, you know. Wow. And then I'd babysit for him, <laughs> you know, because he was teaching at the... Uh, uh, Julius Hart School of Music. Yeah, yeah. He was the head of the percussion department. Yeah, yeah. This was just after the war, 1945. Wow. So I started studying with him. And <clears throat> he says, you know, he says, why don't you come on Saturday? We have a junior orchestra at the Hart School. You know, back then it was called the Julius Hart School of Music. Yeah, Hart School of Music. He says, yeah. but 
it, it became uh, part of the University of Hartford. Right. So I started going rehearsing there with the, you know, kids, high, you know, junior high school kids, because they didn't have any percussion players. Interesting. And before you know it, Moshe Paranaf, who became the conductor of the Hartford Symphony, you know, he would really get on me. Well, you came in early, this and that, you know. And before you know it, I started to put it all together. Yeah. And I was working days then. Saturdays, they allowed me to come to the art school to rehearse. You know, I had part, you know, part-time jobs. Eventually, I got to be, you know, like at 16, because I quit school. Mm. I never went to high school. I, I went to high school, but only until the 10th grade. Wow. <clears throat> I quit school because during the war to help out, yeah, you know. Yeah. So anyways, I started doing that, you know, playing for the school orchestra at the Hart School, Saturdays. And then Lee Pack said to me one day, he says, you know what? He says, uh, the Hartford Symphony is starting up. Now I'm about 17 at this time. Yeah. And he says, I think you ought to audition for the Hartford Symphony. Wow. He says, you've been playing with the Hart Orchestra. Yeah. You know, you've had some good experience. He says, I think you're ready. So I went and auditioned. And who's the other gentleman that's auditioning with me is the drummer from the Pitt Orchestra <laughs> at the State Theater, Bob Schultz. <laughs> So it's Lee Pack, me, and Bob Schultz. That was the percussion <laughs> oh, section. Oh, that is incredible. And <clears throat> they told me you were your first percussion. Can you imagine? <laughs> they made you first. <laughs> I, I'm telling my old teacher what to play. <laughs> so, you know, but he, then Lee Pack said, you know what? You better start practicing mallets, you know, doing yeah. mallets. I'll give you some mallet lessons. And But, but then we were in, uh, you know, uh, it got to a point where I was just a beginner, so I told him about Amo Richards, Amo, my buddy, sure. that I grew up with. They, they needed to get a, uh, they had a mallet player, and I can't remember his name, but he was a pretty bad alcoholic. Yeah. And he started screwing up, so they said, we need to get a, you know, a better, a new mallet player. So I told Lee Pack about Amo. So, I met Lee Pack and we went to Amo's house. Amo lived at what we called the bottom. It was a black neighborhood, yeah. you know. And Amo's mother owned a uh, liquor store there and they lived right on top of the liquor oh, store. So I brought Lee Pack there and it says, Amo, there's an opening for the Hartford Symphony to play mallets. So we went upstairs and there's a marimba, a beautiful, uh, uh, Deegan Marimba wow. with a blanket on it, with a blanket on it. <laughs> and then with, I says, Amos, because when we used to go to go and come from school, we used to hang at Amos' house, and we used to freak out because Amos would put a blanket there, and he played a flight of the bumblebee without, you know, no music, no nothing, with a blanket over the bar. Oh, which muffled the sound, right? Yeah, but, yeah. you know, no bad notes. Yeah. <laughs> they couldn't even Can see what imagine? he was playing. You know. He couldn't even see the notes. Right. He knew what to play. Unbelievable. Then he took it off, and Lee Pack brought some music. He says, here, play this. And he sight read the heck oh. out of that stuff. <laughs> so Amo Richards and I were, he was the mallet player, and I was the multiple percussionist, and Lee Pack was the timpanist. This is amazing. And then, you know, things, I got older, and got a reputation as a, you know, drummer also, of course. And I was playing uh, five nights a week in a jazz club. You know, what they would uh, bring in like Zoot Sims, Al Cohen, people yeah. like that. So I got a chance to play with some really great jazz artists. Great experience, great, yeah. great experience. So that's how far that all came. And then, uh, <clears throat> Uh, one of the local contractors, you know, uh, dance contractors, you know, society, right. uh, guys that, you know, he booked uh, bands at the country clubs. Private parties and Harvard country clubs. Parties. And yeah, yeah. I, I started working for him, and then, you know, he knew that I was a percussionist and all that. 
and all that stuff. So he decided that, you know, he asked me to, that we're going to premiere a Broadway musical called Man of La Mancha. Hmm. And Richard Kiley was the lead, you know, in that. Yeah. So I did that show. And you played what kind of parts? I played timpani, all percussion. Yeah. I could have either played the drum part or the, or, or you know, the, the, the yeah. percussion part. So I decided to do the percussion. I wanted to get more experience with percussion. So you wanted to challenge yourself to get more experience. That's brilliant. Yeah. So I did that show, and I don't, you know, I don't know how much Broadway shows you've done, but you know, after you do a few, yeah. you start to get bored. But yeah, I was yeah, at yeah. a point in my life where, where am I going? Yeah. You know. Uh, is this it for me? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, playing in the symphony, uh, it wasn't paying that kind of money. Yeah. You know, we, we were living paycheck to paycheck. So what happened one weekend, I'm playing with uh, Donald Byrd, great jazz trumpet Absolutely, player. Absolutely, yeah. I'm playing at every Monday night at this jazz club in Hartford. Donald Byrd's, uh, you know, the artist this time. And Amo Richards comes in town and he brings Frank Cap, a famous drummer from L.A., yeah. with him. So I get talking to Amo during a break, and he says, hey, why don't you come and visit me in California? Come on, man. About you know, what year is this? This is 1965. Okay. I'm doing Man of La Mancha, and it's, uh, I'm doing the, uh, uh, what do they call it, the matinee. The afternoon, yeah, yeah. And I says, you know, I think I'll give Amo uh, a call because we already had done Man of La Mancha. Now we're doing like a Gilbert and Sullivan. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How yeah. boring. Yeah, those yeah, are. yeah. Those are, those are tough shows. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, I says, uh, I think I'll give Amo a call, see if he'll, if he's still up to having me come out to visit him. So I gave him a call. He says, yeah, come on. I was, I lucked out. He was home because he, you know, he, he was telling me how busy he was, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. So I gave him a call. I lucked out and I went out to see him. Now, did you go out by yourself or All with your alone. family? All no, alone. no. Okay. My wife says, you, you go. Yeah. I don't want to get in the way, you know. Yeah. You may want to hang this and that, right, you right, know. Right. So I came out. I spent a week with him and I couldn't believe it. He... Eight o'clock in the morning, we get up. Uh, no, what am I saying? Seven. And we had to be at MGM at nine. He'd do a three-hour session, get in the car, go to Paramount Pictures, do another three-hour session. You know, and after that, at night, seven o'clock, go to TTG for a recording session with uh, Stan Kenton's orchestra, orchestra when yeah. he did that. Uh, Artists and rhythms, they had to yeah, do the shows. Those, yeah, one of those, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that's, that's how it was all week long. I couldn't believe it. And then I'm looking at the kind of, you know, the music and how what it takes, the running around yeah, and all yeah. this and that. So the week was over, and Amo says, Joe, what'd you think? I says, you know what, Amo? I love it, man. This is what I want to do. Wow. This is all the years I've, because now at this time, I had been in the Hartford Symphony for 17 years. Interesting. And I did all, we had to do three operas a year. Yeah. All the major operas. What a great training that you had at that point. And the Hart School, the Julius Hart, yeah. is famous for operatic, hmm. you know, yeah. music. Yeah. I, did, I did Johnny Skiki there. I did uh, La Stal de Soldat by yes, Stravinsky yes, because yes. they didn't have any percussionists oh that gosh, were at that yeah. level to do it. Amazing. You know, like guys studying conducting there, yeah. they wanted to do Le Soir du Soldat <laughs> and they couldn't find a percussionist to do it. They had to go outside, which was me. <laughs> so I did it twice. <laughs> and I did uh, Sonata for Two Percussion and Two Piano by Bartok. Again, I was an outsider, but there wasn't any percussionist going into school that could handle it. Wow, so I lucked out, yeah. you know, doing Gosh. all, no money, you know, 
nothing like that, but the experience I got was... You may have lucked out, but you had the tools and the preparation and the skills to make it happen. That's important. I, I, well, sight, from the years of doing it, you just kept on doing it. What a skill, yeah. Sight reading came to yeah. me, I don't know, it's just one of those things. Yeah. And that's what it takes to come to L.A. Yeah, you yeah, got, yeah. You know, you, there's no mess in the world. Yeah, man. yeah. So, so but, anyways, I, I, you know, I did all that material, so it prepared me for L.A., yeah. you know. So I moved. I, I went home, and my wife says, what do you think? I says, and I told Lamar, I said, I need one year to really work on my mallets. Mm. So, man, I went in my garage back east, you know, and, you know, after work, you know, I had a day job then. I was a chauffeur for the president of an insurance company, mm. you know. So, you know, at night I'd get in that garage and mallets, 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 oh, mallets, mallets. Cool. And you had a family at the time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Four kids. Yeah. And then Amo got drafted. He <laughs> went to Korea. Yeah. You know. So I took over the mallet chair, you know, which meant, you know, I had to play all that great mallet repertoire. Porgy and Bess, all that stuff. Out on the West Coast? No. In the East Coast? Back in. So you do all that in the East the Coast? Symphony. Wow. With the with symphony. With the symphony. Wow. I came to L.A. <clears throat> I saved some money. You know, sold our house, and then before I went to L.A., I went to the conductor, beautiful, great conductor. His name was Arthur Winograd, and I went up to him. I says, Mr. Winograd, uh, I says, I'd like to go and see if I could uh, go to L.A. and see if I can get into the studios. I says, because I've been there. I saw what those guys have to do, and it's a, you know, great challenge. He says, I'll give you one year. You can come back and your job will be here. Interesting. Because we kind of got along. Yeah, know. yeah. So we went. We went to L.A. So you packed the car and drove out? or With, right? the, with the few instruments, I hired a trucking company. Yeah. We brought very little furniture, not yeah. very much, and most of my instruments, my temps, my xylophone, stuff like that. We brought, you know, we, we, I had a station wagon. <clears throat> Four kids, <laughs> my wife and I, and we drove to LA. <laughs> and we kind of treated it like a vacation. Yeah. You know, we took our time, you know, just went the northern route, took our time, and, you know, stopped. Because as far as I'm concerned, me, I hate driving. Yeah. And I, we drove maybe three, four hours tops, and that was it. Beautiful. We really took our time. Beautiful. And you know, when I got to LA, I just saw a sign, you know, realtor. I jumped, went inside. There's all these ladies lined up with, <laughs> you know. I says to the lady, I got my wife and four kids in the car, and I need a house, not an apartment. I need a house to rent. Yeah. And I told him my story, you know, I'm a drummer, this and that, you know, I make noise, so <laughs> I want to get my own. Is, there po is it possible to find a rental? She went in her little box, you know. She says, can you afford $135 a month? I says, yeah. <laughs> right near NBC Studios oh, on my. Cordova Street. <laughs> Would you believe that? <laughs> right near NBC Studios <laughs> where everything is happening. Unbelievable. You know? Jeff and I, we went in the garage, we got some rugs, we went to, you know, found some old rugs, we nailed them up on the garage door, we didn't use the garage, yeah. you know, so we could practice in there. Oh, that's hysterical. Can you imagine, Jeffrey, I think, was uh, 10, 12, something and he like had, that. Did he have a drum set of his own that he was starting to no, work on? No, no, just mine. Yeah. But we, eventually, I got him a drum set. Yeah, yeah. No, he, in Connecticut, he didn't even have a drum set. He just practiced on my... He could hardly at first reach the pedals. You know? Oh yeah, this, let me tell you. Uh, I had a friend here, Dave McKay, a great jazz. He was blind. Yeah. Blind piano player. And he called me up well, about a couple of weeks after I was in L.A. Yeah. And he says, uh, what are you doing the week of whenever? He says, Chet Baker's coming into Shelley's manhole. <laughs> and he needs a drummer. I said, wow, you know, there's Larry Bunker here, there's all these great guys. 
He says, uh, he told me to get a drummer. <laughs> you want to do it or not? I said, yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> and <clears throat> did I ever luck out getting that gig because Shelly's group, Shelly Mann, yeah. played there before the main group would come up. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I played first set and I get off the bandstand, I go into the green room where the guys are hanging. Yeah. Shelly says, hey, skinny. He <laughs> called me skinny because Dave McKay told him my nickname. He says, come over here, sit down. He says, tell me about yourself. And I, you know, I told him, yeah. you know. He says, yeah, man. He says, uh, I, uh, I, I'm going to mention your name to some of the, you know, contractors because uh, Dave tells me you're a percussionist too. Mm. You know, mallets and all that. Yeah, yeah, I do that, you know. So he says, uh, also, I do a television show called Doctari. Yeah. You know, it's about Africa, it's but comical. Yeah, yeah. He says, uh, Larry Bunker, you know, uh, I do it. Uh, Larry Bunker does it. And Shelley was the composer on that show. Interesting. He read out, write out the melody, and uh, Mike Wofford, this orchestrator, would orchestrate it. Interesting. The very next week, I get a call from his contractor to do Doctari. About what year is this? This is 1960, about 67. Yeah. So now you, so you, that was the door that opened up, probably that led to everything else because, I mean, that really was, you know, you did so much different movies and TV stuff. Tom, I can't tell you. If this is a, a way of you and I yeah. getting a, a message to kids, yeah. you know, what could happen in your life, right. you know, uh, what happened to me was that the invaluable experience I got doing legit music, right, right. playing opera, right. playing, I even played for strippers, man. <laughs> I played for belly dancers. That's a, that's a wide range of performing. And talk <laughs> about playing odd meters. Yeah. I mean, from Springfield, Mass, these chicks used to come down at the El Morocco, this club, yeah. and we had a oud player that was incredible, <laughs> Jimmy King. Yeah. And, you know, he taught me how to play 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, and, and 15. What experience? And if I missed, if I was playing in 7, and I, I blew it at rehearsal, that belly dancer would give me the dirtiest look. Yes, you knew. And the finger symbols? Yeah, yeah. Chick playing in seven yeah, man, yeah, thirteen. Yeah, yeah. It was incredible. What experience. What but you you were willing to learn. You were really like a sponge to take this in. That's an important quality. Not everybody has that quality. <clears throat> well, what helped me seep that all in was playing bar talk. Yeah, yeah. The right uh, the I played the timpani, second timpani part to the rights of, of spring by yeah. Stravinsky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's you hard know, all, stuff. all, all that, that, that that's, that experience yeah, playing yeah. the odd meters all over the place, you know. So and then being, you know, I know I'm. I, it's it's hard, man, yeah. to uh, like how did how was I able to, you know, be a bebop player, yeah. and then because I know I used to get flack from some of the other percussions, percussionists and and the symphony, you know. Oh, there there he goes. He's going to but you know play a jazz gig, you know. And he, but I knew, my teacher taught me, Joe, when you play with the orchestra, you, if it's an eighth note, you play an eighth you, note, it's legitimately, not a jazz eighth right, note. Little, if yeah. it's a sixteenth note, yeah. you know, and he taught me how to lay back, yeah, yeah, listen, yeah. you know, don't just go ahead and play, listen to who you're playing that note with. Right. You know, things like that. You know, the musical things you have yeah, to know Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's so deep. So I had that's an deep, incredible teacher. That's man. deep information that you took in to, to play for because that, you have yeah. to really know the difference. But you were in the right mindset. Whatever, you know, gig or performance you went to, you were there in that moment fully prepared to adapt to what you were playing. That's, that's, yeah. that's really amazing. Yeah. That really is amazing. Yeah. So you get to California, you're, you're working there. How did the children get involved with the music? I mean, when they got involved in playing and... Probably that's the best thing that could have ever happened to us is moving to California yeah, together yeah. because we, we hung tight yeah. as a family. Yeah. 
you know, uh, Jeff got to the point where, you know, when he went to school, he played in the, you know, yeah. junior high school, the yeah. school orchestra. Yeah. And I saw what was happening with him and with Mike, you know, they, you know, even back in Hartford before we moved, you know, Mike was taking guitar lessons, Jeffrey, you know, they weren't to the Beatles. When the Beatles came on the yeah, scene, yeah, man, yeah. everything changed in our yeah, That house, was 1964, you know? that's that when the Beatles hit. When I heard them on Ed Sullivan in February of 1964, that's what pulled me into music in the process. And, I, and all my conversations with Jeff, we used to relate to that, yeah. that it was just so powerful that you just <clears> wanted to play music. So they, they learned back in the Hartford days, so they come out to L.A. now, and they're now starting to play. I remember uh, when they were in uh, junior, no, this is, be, this is elementary school. Mm. When the Beatles came out, Remo had one of those uh, practice drum sets. Right. I don't know if you remember. I do, I do remember those, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not the, pa you know, not the kind of electronic pads no, they have today. No, it was a little practice drum set. Yeah. 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 And uh, Mike cut out cardboard box he cut out like what looked like a bass, you know. <laughs> and Steve had a little keyboard, you know, and they did a, at school, at a entertainment night one night, they imitated the Beatles and oh they won God. first prize. Oh my gosh, oh God. And I knew Jeff, something was going on with Jeff because I remember once, uh, uh, <clears throat> he was in the Boy Scouts and it was Memorial Day and it was about, you know, 40, 50 Boy Scouts marching. And then at the very back of the line, you hear this with a field drum, this little kid. <laughs> playing the bow diddly. You know, and just, just grooving and marching these kids. You know, it was such a great feeling. So I had a strong feeling that, you know, and Mike, my son Mike yeah, also, yeah. you know, started on drums too. They all did. Steve, my son Steve, the keyboard player with Toto yeah. in junior high school, Absolutely. he played all the mallet, all the timpani parts. So they went on to really understand and, rhythm and, and, yeah, and the they beginning were, stages. They, and I used to take them to all the children's concerts yeah. with the Hartford Symphony. Yeah. You know, when I played in the Hartford Symphony, I always... So Once a were, month, we did were, a children's concert. Wow. They would come help me lug in the temps and all that, the percussion. Boy, the foundation that they had, I mean, you know, Jeff and Mike. Not and formal, Steve, but, But you the know. foundation that they had, you know, first of all, that, that Italian family closeness bond, which gave them an incredible level of security. Then having the advantage of seeing you doing what you're doing, and then them putting the band together. And Toto is, my gosh, I used to go see them all the time when I moved out here in 76 and, and met Jeff. Just the depth of music that your kids got involved with, how great they they played, everything that they played was from the heart and clean and just honest and just powerful that the music today is still powerful. And yeah. what done. Absolutely amazing, yeah. absolutely amazing. Yeah. So, you, so with all of the movies that you've done and with all the intensity of the performances and the uniqueness you and Emil are still are still going strong at what you're doing, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, I'm still, you know, I, I got, you know, uh, uh, talked into teaching like at MI. Yes. I, and I got to say uh, uh, for this interview, something that always stuck in my mind, and it, it, it was kind of dear to me. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you what I mean, how, how you affect kids. Uh, and I've seen your... I've been with you, yeah. with your clinics throughout Germany. Wow. You remember, I we did some that. stuff yes, for yes. Peter Becker and yes. people like that. Yes. But I'll never forget that one thing stands out in my mind is um, at MI, musician, when we started PIT, yeah. is uh, summertime, all the kids at lunchtime are hanging out in front of that building yeah. on Macadam Place. Yes. And you're sitting at the, you know, in the street, the gutter, you're sitting and all the kids are around you and you're talking to the kids, you know, probably, you know, I, I was at a distance. I'm coming from lunch, walking down the <laughs> place and right in front of the entrance 
there you are. You're sitting on the curbstone, <laughs> and all these kids are around you, yeah. and you guys are rapping about, you know, of course, it had to be sure, drums. Sure, sure. <laughs> and it yeah. just, somebody should have taken a picture of that, <laughs> man. You know, made a poster out of it. It's, you know, like, so, that's your thing, man. It you really know, is. To get, you're get you're get such an to, educator. To feel. know to how to, you know. Tap into really, passion. It really is pretty amazing. Yeah, I wish I, I had what you had going, man. Oh, man, but, but you, you've inspired me, Joe, more than you probably realize. In all of my journey and travels, your name comes up so often, and the whole Procaro family name of what the, the movement that you guys have created in music is everlasting. It's yeah, we used powerful. to talk about albums and drummers, you yeah, know. Yeah. And one thing uh, I got to bring out, you know, people ask me about Jeff. Well. You know, he became a, a well-known rock drummer. Legend. I yeah. thought he was going to be a jazz drummer. Yeah. I'll tell you why. No, seriously. He knew all the or albums. Or even, even an instrumentalist, because yeah. my wife and I would be in bed, grooving, and I'm listening to uh, Miles Davis, yeah. Bags Groove, because yeah. back then, you know, Max Roach and Miles Davis, that's all I played. That was it, yeah, know. yeah, that was it. And... <clears throat> Miles Davis is playing his solo. Do 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 do, and this little squirt is singing in it <laughs> in his crib. <laughs> you know, he was about three years old in the crib, four or whatever. <laughs> He's singing Miles' solo, <laughs> and in pitch, you know, pretty close. Yeah. But he's, and I says, he's going to be a jazz trumpet player. Oh, man. No way. Yeah. A, a baby like that yeah, is able yeah. to sing? Yeah. <laughs> and then the Beatles came along and screwed everything. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say to the young students listening in closing? What kind of advice would you give them, the next generation, as they listen to this in years to come? One great thing I think I'm, I, I'm so happy I did was I say to Jeff, Every Saturday when we moved to L.A., you know, I says, Jeff, I says, what do you think? There's a, there's a, a guy, a percussionist, Barry Silverman. I says, he, does, he gets kids together every Saturday, and he does percussion ensemble stuff, you know. Like one minute you're playing bongos, the next minute you're playing bass drum. He teaches you how to play a triangle yeah, properly. Yeah. He teaches you how to play the bass drum, stuff like that, you know. And he went. I mm -hmm. thought he was going to say, you know, get lost. I, I don't <laughs> want that crap. Yeah, yeah. But he did it. He went, yeah. He did it. Get involved in a little bit of everything. So, then. yeah. My story and his story, right, yeah. are so related. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When it comes to drumming. How amazing. And, you know, a music career. So, what, what is it? What happened? You know, so what I tell these kids is get all the experience you can get. No matter, don't, don't say, oh, I don't want to play that kind of music. You know, I don't want to do this. You know, do that, do this. I, I've had some famous guys come to me, you know, say, Joe, oh, if I, if I get my reading together, man, I can get all this studio work, you know. I say, yeah, man, you know, Learning how to read is, you know, very important. Your talent only goes so far. Yeah, right, right. right you know what I mean? Right, then you right. walk into a brick wall. Right, right. Because right. now you're on the spot. You got to <laughs> read that. Yeah, yeah. Nobody's going to teach you to read in five minutes. I says it takes years, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's it, man. Well, it's amazing. Take it all in. You know, get that's all the experience you could get. Play any kind of music because you don't know what you're going to get hit with down the road. Absolutely. Boy, what amazing advice. And it's a lifetime commitment. You know yeah, that. Just, just still learning and still doing it. It really is. Thank you so much, Joe. It's amazing how much you have to offer and what you develop in just this the spirit of who you are. As I said, just being in your presence is in, like it's an enlightenment. It really is. You have, you have a touch and a magic to every word that you speak and every note that you play. For that, I thank you very much on behalf of the sessions. You are absolutely the best, Joe. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs>